Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it, without knowing what's going to happen next. Gilda Radner Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Season 2, Episode 2. I am Anna Christie from Vancouver, Canada, recovered emetophobic licensed psychotherapist specializing in emetophobia, and your host for this podcast. Today, I am absolutely thrilled beyond all measure to have as my guests Dr. David Veal and Dr. Alexandra Keyes from London, England, and I want to introduce them properly. Alexandra Keyes is a clinical psychologist and BABCP accredited cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, offering evidence-based CBT to both NHS and private patients. She works at a national specialist residential unit for people with severe and enduring anxiety disorders at the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. She completed her doctoral research investigating time-intensive CBT therapies and imagery rescripting in emetophobia. She has published scientific papers on the subject of emetophobia and is passionate about raising awareness and improving accessible treatments for those who have the condition. She is a trustee of Emetophobia Action, the national charity for emetophobia. David Veal is a consultant psychiatrist in cognitive behavioral psychotherapies and leads a national outpatient and residential unit service for people with severe treatment refractory anxiety disorders at the South London and Maudsley Trust and the Priori Hospital North London. He is a visiting professor at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, King's College London. He has been researching emetophobia since 2005 and has published 11 scientific papers on the topic. He was a member of the group that wrote the NICE guidelines on OCD in 2006 and chaired the NICE evidence update on OCD in 2013. He is an honorary fellow of the British Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Psychotherapies, a fellow of the British Psychological Society, and a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He is a trustee of the National Charities Emetophobia Action, OCD Action, and the Body Dysmorphic Disorder Foundation. I warmly welcome them both to our show. And just as a side note, when I met with um, doctors, Dr. Keyes and Dr. Veal, I was coming down with laryngitis, and I have recorded re- re-recorded the introduction here. So at least it is very clear. Um, and you'll notice, unfortunately, my voice isn't... Um, top notch, but uh, getting the three of us together, as I'm sure you can well imagine, was a different, difficult scheduling. So here we are. So welcome, Dr. Veal and Dr. Keyes. I'm so excited to have you here today. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you for inviting us. It's yeah. Wonderful to be here. <laughs> yes, it's um, it's lovely to be able to interview you all the way in London, England, um, and I'm here in Vancouver, Canada. Um, especially, I have a nasty cold, and there's no way you can catch it. So that's or or COVID either, for that matter. <laughs> um, the book again is "Free Yourself from Emetophobia." Uh, absolutely fantastic book. I'm so excited. I was almost in tears reading it um, because when I started putting out information on the internet in about 2008, there was nothing. Uh, um, There was certainly not much on the internet. And then uh, books have been few, far between and usually self-published. So this is... um, you know, published by Jessica Kingsley 
it's just so exciting to have it and to have the two of you as well. Um, I want to start um, by just uh, what one of the things you begin with is that emetophobic people should have goals and those goals should not just be not having emetophobia anymore. Yeah. Um, and in your in your book, you talk about SMART goals. Um, Dr. Keyes, could, could you explain uh, SMART goals? Sure. Um, so this is something that we use um, in cognitive behavioral therapy to kind of um, make goals kind of a bit more specific and something that we can work on throughout the course of therapy, really. Um, so uh, specific, measurable, um, achievable, um, David, help me out. What's the R? Realistic. Um, is it relevant? Realistic. But realistic relevant. and uh, time. <laughs> time. <laughs> time measured. Um, time. So, yeah, this is really something that just helps people to define where they want to go, I guess, over the course of therapy. So it's not so much, um, you know, I just I, often people will say things like I want to be better. I want to I don't want to be scared anymore. But actually, we want to help people to move towards thinking a bit more detail about what actually what does that look like for you? Is it kind of going back to restaurants? Is it um, is it seeing friends at a pub? Is it going back to, to uni or, or having a job? You know, let's make this measurable. So we know exa exactly what we're working towards. Right. Yeah, that, that it is so important. Um, I've heard of uh, the SMART goals from my son-in-law, who's a teacher, uh, my daughter, and, and he live here with us and, and with their children. And um, so I recognized it, but other folks might not. But it's a, it's a great way to explain. Uh, I usually say something like, what can you not do now that you really want to do? You know, what are the things? Um, and it could be something as life changing as having children or or it could be, yeah, going to the pub with my friends. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, one of the one of the things that you use in the book to illustrate, which I found brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an actual copy of the book yet, <laughs> um, but I do have the the PDF. Um, uh, it, it was a it, you call it the vicious flower, and um, and so I don't have the the picture, but I can well imagine. Um, Dr. Veal, could you could you explain what what is this vicious flower uh, imagery that you? Well, one of the things I think that happens in therapy is to have a good understanding of what's keeping the problem going. Yeah, and we know that. Uh, in uh, a, a, a metaphobia, individuals will ex with, with metaphobia will experience particular bodily sensations of particularly right. nausea and feeling bloated and so on. And very likely, you're likely to be misinterpreting those as evidence of impending catastrophe in terms of vomiting. Right. And one of the key processes is this difficulty in tolerating not knowing yeah, when you yes. whether you might or might not vomit. So even though you know that the risk of vomiting is very low, the uh, uncertainty around it, it we think is probably a key issue. Yeah, um, because you just cannot bear not knowing. In fact, you know, um, knowing you're going to vomit is probably easier to prepare for. Yeah, right know what is going to happen and how it won't last very long and so on. So it's the uncertainty of it. So these, com the combination of um, thinking you're going to vomit, not knowing whether you're going to vomit, and underestimating perhaps your ability to cope and um, how much influence you can have over it, all combine to this, this, the anxiety and the panic around it, and perhaps other images that surround it. So all these go around in a vicious circle of mm -hmm. um, like, like a panic attack happening very quickly. And then right. on the edges of this vicious circle are the various ways of coping with this panic. Yeah? So particularly people will try perhaps to escape to avoid the situation, be able to check or monitor whether they might vomit, they might be seeking reassurance, they might be trying to control whether they vomit, and so on. So all these ways of coping feed 
that vicious circle because of course they have very many unintended consequences you know the more that you check and monitor yourself the more it actually feeds your distress and it just goes round right. in this circle yeah so that we know that all the ways of coping are the problem they're not the solution Right, so they're the petals of the flower. The petals um, of the flower. And, the, and like the center of the flower is is all the things you, you don't like, that you're nauseous, you're anxious, you, you have all these, you're worrying, you're checking, you know, and and the uh, avoidance and the safety-seeking behaviors. Um, I, I just usually refer to them as safety behaviors, but they're yeah. the petals of the flower and those petals have to go, it seems. Yeah, exactly. so, so, so the flower is vicious. Um, is very vicious. I, I, think, I think of it as a daisy, maybe where you know you, put, you she, she loves me, she loves me not, but this flower is all she loves me not, 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 not take them all out. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and then you can then you'll get to the center, uh, uh, which would be getting rid of it. And I think it also points to how it may be easier to focus on the ways that you are coping and responding on the outside because it's very tough to try to diffuse and to try to cope with the way you're the, 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 trying to tolerate that uncertainty and to help you to, to um, develop a different twist on things in the middle. Right. Yeah, I have, you know, so many people uh, have said to me, what if today's the day? You know, like it, it could be today, it could be right now, and um, that, is the that is the uncertainty. That is what is people struggling with is not knowing. Even yeah. though they know that the risk of vomiting is very low, it's the not knowing which is the problem. Yes, yeah, and I tell them often. Uh, I live in Vancouver here, where much like the west coast of the United States, we're on one of those fault lines. So at any moment, we could have a, an earthquake that, that destroys the house and kills you. And uh, when the kids at the school have an earthquake drill, they hide under the table. Um, mm. But you can't live under the table. You know, and no one in Vancouver lives under the, under the table. Um, and so, you know, that, that that's kind of how... I often explain it to people. Um, so that, that's a very important analogy, I think, because it's something you can do to prepare yourself in the way that we all have fire. Well, we just tend to have ordinary boring fire drills in the UK. But as you say, an earthquake drill is something you can prepare for so you're ready for it. So in many ways, that's what you're doing also with the emetophobia, to prepare yourself to be practice ready for, for, for volunteering, yeah. perhaps. And that's why perhaps the exposure tasks are preparing you for it right yes that's that's a, that's brilliant absolutely um the, the the next the next bit which i think is is really um a great way of of illustrating that that you've done in this book uh you talk about theory a and theory b so if i could just read a little bit um theory a well, I'll paraphrase, you're always uh, at risk of vomiting. You think vomiting is 100% awful, uh, catastrophic. You must know when you're going to vomit. If you do, you will lose control. Uh, if you do vomit, you'll lose control. And, and it may go on and on, and you, you're afraid it'll never stop. So that's theory A, and that's where most emetophobic people are living in this theory A. Theory B... Uh, vomiting is unpleasant. I always say nobody likes it, but you can cope with it. You cannot control it, uh, and but you can tolerate not knowing when it might happen. Is that a fair paraphrase? No, I think that's absolutely right. And um, the key thing in each of those theory A, theory Bs is to actually follow it through in terms of how you're then going to behave uh, if theory A is true, you've got to carry on avoiding, carry on checking, carry, and, and your life will be misery. Yeah, but if you can follow theory B and it's really tough to do that, then obviously it means uh, doing the things which are important in your life, that you're important, that you value, and reclaiming your life because it's essentially a worry problem, an anxiety problem, and therefore requires a different solution. 
vomiting is not a problem. Um, Anxiety is a problem. Mm. Um, But but, uh, yeah, vomiting is is not dangerous or harmful. One of my colleagues here in Vancouver is retired now, but he's a very gentle man, uh, Peter Sillen. And he said to me one time, vomiting is your body's way of caring for you. (laughs) <laughs> I, I thought that was just if you knew him you'd know it's just so sweet um like he is but i think isn't that a lovely image too you know i mean if you're poisoned or you're overwhelmed with virus of some kind um yeah your body's going to care for you i think that's um something that we is a really good um place to start when we're treating people with a metaphobia and actually giving people a bit of information about why vomiting is in fact a really helpful kind of process that keeps us safe um and if we weren't able to vomit um um as as some animals can't so like rats for example um if we weren't able to vomit then actually we probably would wouldn't survive as a species because we would succumb to toxins and and you know disease and all those kinds of things so it's actually very protective for us um and, and helpful in that respect. So, yeah, absolutely. It's it's <laughs> our way of uh, our body's way of caring for us, as your as your friend put it. But the problem, I was going to say, the problem is, is as you know, that when you ask many people with a metaphobia whether they'd prefer to die or to vomit, they would prefer to die. You know, if you've got the option of pressing the button, mm. or die rather than vomiting, and I'm in control. Mm. <laughs> then right. they would prefer to die, and uh, that is how awful how terrible it is for an emetophobic yes. Yeah. yes and and i think that's one of the reasons why your book brought tears to my eyes because so many therapists even those trained in cbt and even many of those who understand uh, about emetophobia and they've heard of it don't often get how serious it can mm. be mm. and i i know with with the clients I have had, um, I've had very few that had what I would consider like a mild or a moderate case of emetophobia. Usually their lives are in, in ruins and, and they are desperate to uh, get help. So I, I think one of the things we really want to do, and not only with this book, but also a charity we're trying to develop, is actually to get across to people the seriousness, the severity mm. of metaphobia because it is still treated as a bit of a joke by many people mm, and uh, right. I, I think you know, that's one of our major uh, objectives is to to help people recognize that it's not just some simple silly specific phobia you know like spiders or something yeah there's a lot of pain for people i was just yeah i was thinking in, in my own experience people often won't even come come for help really because well firstly that I guess they don't have the vocabulary or the words to, to or the knowledge you know to describe this problem and they don't really know that it's something that's shared by other people um and that that's kind of the lack of information really that's out there and that's another reason why we wanted to make this book and this information accessible but also to kind of challenge the stigma of it as David says and, and to, to 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 help people to know that they're not alone and it's not shameful and it's not their fault and and that there's support available Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's lovely. It brings uh, so many questions to my mind, actually. But um, Dr. Veal, you mentioned the, the charity and it, it's so interesting and ironic. I, I have a brand new client university um, fellow in the United States. And he he was going to be playing a game where if you win this game online thing and if you win you you win a thousand dollars or something and he was going to donate it to the emetophobia charity wow. and I said oh emetophobia charity well he didn't win so don't get too excited <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I didn't I hadn't heard of it and my you know my like. Uh, suspicion is always raised because there's always people out there trying to exploit emetophobic people and so on. So I, it took me a while to find, actually, the Emetophobia Action Charity. I was very excited to read that. I've got a, a list on my wall. And I think you're both trustees or you're on the board. Um, and this, uh, perhaps one of you could talk a little bit more about it. It's Let me just say it's at 
emetaction.org. I will put a link on my website as well and, and uh, mention it at the end of the podcast. Um, sure. Yeah, I can. I can take this one. Um, so it's it's kind of um, a project or a charity that's in its infancy. Really, we we set it up last year. Um, Emetophobia Action. We we have a website and we're we're just kind of in the in the process of of starting to fundraise um, so that we can kind of meet our objectives, which is really to to get information out there that's that's kind of evident evidence based. Because um, as you say, there's a lot of stuff out there that that. Um, people with emetophobia might kind of look up online but that, that actually can be can be less helpful so so kind of having sound um, information out there places where people can go and, and read about it and read about what's helpful um, to think about kind of evidence-based research and just to provide kind of resources for, for, for people to, to kind of get good treatment really and to get better. And, and eventually perhaps to raise funds for research be able to be you know a uh, a place for the community to be able to come together at conferences and things like that. So um, certainly in the UK, we have quite a wrong, a strong, rich tradition of charities, um, which, you know, so we, we have one for, I'm a trustee of the people with, um, for OCD action, another one for body dysmorphic disorder and things like that. Right. So um, it's, it's quite a strong tradition. Um it's mainly usually about trying to help sufferers in terms of providing good information. I, we're not going to, I think, try to produce a bulletin board or something for people to come to because there already is one um, and it's a lot of work to do. It is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, you know, I think we're going to be fairly modest at the firms. I think we're going to try and have a conference at some stage, perhaps a hybrid so that people can have – uh, both uh, join online as well as in person and um, to see what happens. We don't know where it's going to go yet. That's, that's great. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, I just, uh, you know, it's a dream come true for me. I, I had a metaphobia, didn't know what it was called, or, of course, uh, from the time early as I can remember, really maybe three, four years old. Um, and even when I went to university, which was in the 70s, um, and so there, were, there was no internet, no YouTube, like nothing. Mm. And you had to go to, I went to the psychology library, I remember in my spare time, and I would just pour over books looking for anything. I thought, I've got to be the only one that has this, you know. Now, of course, you can just put fear of vomiting into your Google search, and it'll come up with um a, a lot of websites and, and many of them are very good as you can say some aren't so um that's fantastic um uh, what else do i what do i want to ask you so many things um speaking of, well, of I, I research mean, thank you anna because you have been flying the flag for many years and, and uh, <laughs> there are very few websites and resources that that provide good information so you know thank you well well, you're very welcome. Um, and perhaps that will just lead me into my view of how to uh, treat a metaphobia and work with it is always evolving, it's always changing. And so I was glad to read in your book, and you can correct me if I'm, I've misinterpreted it, that the, the, the goal is to be able to live with anxiety and to be able to tolerate it uh, and and not necessarily shut it all down or control it, not necessarily control, unless it's too high, unless it goes too high, then you've got to do something perhaps to bring what I would call the number down a bit. And you even mentioned some things uh, such as, um, I don't know where I have it here, but, you know, breathing and, uh, is, wow. you know, putting your face in cold water mm. and so on. Yeah. So I think it's tricky. I think it's just a small number of people who really struggle with tolerating emotion, yeah, who have difficulties in regulating emotion, it's called. And it's those individuals who really can't cope with anxiety and that might be leading them to perhaps self-harm or do other dangerous things where we have to come into that sort of, Thing. But for most, the large majority of people, it is possible to learn how to 
tolerate those feelings and to um, tolerate also just the uncertainty of not knowing, you know, which is a slightly different right. feeling. But as I said, I'm starting to think about it differently. And indeed, my clients can tolerate a great deal of anxiety, yeah. um, you're especially with. You're a lot more authentic, I think, as a therapist, because you've been there. You've been through it. Whereas um, Ali and I have not had emetophobia. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, tell my, I tell my colleagues it helps to build trust because you don't have to build it. You know, so it saves people about you know three or three or four sessions worth of uh, of working with someone. Um, uh, but you know what? Uh, I do say to people online because my even my wait list is closed now. It's I, I'm going to retire before I get to the end of it, uh, probably or die or something. But um, <laughs> you know, it there are lots of therapists out there very understanding and very very knowledgeable they really are um there are a lot who aren't but but uh, I, i'm trying to one of the things i really am trying to get going on my website is a the therapist list just of cbt therapists who are familiar with and have treated emetophobia i can't recommend them because i don't know them you know but mm -hmm. i I know their approach is evidence based and and that's important yeah mm -hmm. um, it, it, one of the things that uh, you talk about in this book is the relationship of emetophobia and to OCD. And I found yeah. this really interesting now in uh, you have a research you did some research dr veal uh, i meant to look it up but i in which you actually i think ocd and emetophobia are both in the title of the article um and you kind of hypothesize that emetophobia might be considered a subset of ocd but in the book you describe ocd and emetophobia on more of a continuum could you tell us a little more about that um, I think the problem with psychiatric diagnoses is that they are, you know, nice categorical descriptions which can be helpful for communication, but they are very limited in terms of how they can help us in, in, in you know, understanding and treatment. So I think my experience is, is that we can think of OCD and emetophobia of being on a continuum whereby at the one end, Emetophobia is a pure phobia of just avoidance of anything to do with vomiting. And at the other end of the continuum are people with OCD with emetophobia who have lots of excessive reassurance seeking and checking and magical thinking and so on, much more like OCD. And they may have other features of OCD as well. So, yes. um, but I think most people probably are in the middle. <laughs> and mm. you'll find but some people get called having OCD um, when perhaps other people might call them emetophobia. So it's it's just a name. Uh, we think tend to think of emetophobia as being separate and important, uh, but sometimes it will clearly overlap with those symptoms of emetophobia, of OCD. I haven't found uh, that I can remember uh, a person who did not have some mm -hmm. uh, qualities of OCD, uh, emetophobic people um, it, that I've worked with, they, they, yes, and you're right, in different degrees and and to different extent. I do um, yeah, enough that I I went and took some extra training just on OCD because it. It just kept coming up over and over again. A lot of people, too, I find um, they say, you know, they're like, well, and then I was told by my, you know, psychologist or what or whoever that I have OCD. So it's it's almost like now I have two things <laughs> and I must be really bad or awful. Um when, you know, I like to say to them, it, it's really the treatment's the same. So they're very, very related. You don't have, you know, you're not extra 
uh, ill, mentally ill. This is just the, what you have. So it's interesting. It's another thing to work with other conditions. You know, so for example, you, there are a much smaller number of people with fears of being incontinent. Shall we say? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't tend to be so prominent or, or get mixed up with, with OCD. I don't know what you think, Ali. Have you come across anyone fears of incontinence at the other yeah, end? A few, a few. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's one sometimes you get it with vomiting like as well, a... but not only. Yeah. Nope, really... yep. we've got uh, a bit of a delay with Dr. Keyes. Uh, go ahead then. Sorry, my my internet is a little bit patchy at times. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, who? <laughs> yeah, you go, you go ahead. So, yeah, I know who I'm looking at, but <laughs> Dr. Keyes, yeah. go, go ahead with what you were saying. <laughs> um, well, I, I was just saying, like, um, in terms of when you were saying that some people had been um, – had told by a health professional that they had OCD as well. I guess it, it, that in itself can, can be sometimes an issue because there is a bit of confusion even amongst health professionals around the diagnoses because a lot of the symptoms overlap so much. Yes. Um, you know, someone with yes. emetophobia might be excessively washing their hands and then that, you know, looks like OCD. Um, but I guess it's getting to the core of actually what the main fear is um, that kind of sets them apart, I guess, and, and why they're doing that behaviour. Um and unless that's properly understood, then I guess you are going to have these kind of messy, these messy diagnoses um, that are perhaps less helpful for the person's own understanding of the problem. Right. Um, I wrote the chapter in the book that we're writing on misdiagnoses because it drives me crazy. <laughs> you know, some of the things that people are diagnosed with, I, I and and I think there are. Uh, probably 20 of them in the DSM-5 that that people have been diagnosed with when that it is it is not that is not the diagnosis like it really isn't so yes that's a very frustrating mm-hmm. thing it's something that metaphobics want to give up on the um, you know the, the psychotherapeutic community um, so uh, very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think as well. It kind uh, of now, Doctor. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> um, I was just thinking that's that's part of the problem um, because then that leads to the type of help that that person is is um, kind of pointed towards or um, has access to. And actually, I think many people with emetophobia might be sent, well, in this country anyway, maybe to like a, a physician or, or a general practitioner and be maybe prescribed kind of medication or, or anti-emetic. Um, kind of anti-nausea medication um and they might not actually have access to the right type of psychological help um which again can can make it so much worse for people and 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 can really delay their you know their recovery or their treatment yes yes and their and their self-esteem as well Mm. um or just frustration how many young people that i know especially young girls that have been sent to uh eating disorder Mm. Uh, in in house like clinics, and yes, they have disordered eating, and yes, you know they are very thin, but you know they they don't see themselves as fat. They see themselves as thin and needing to get more weight on them. So it's extremely difficult and frustrating. I can't imagine. I can't mm-hmm. imagine what that would be like. Um, now, Dr. Veal, you were asking, uh, there are people with a fear of incontinence, um, in, and, and that's one of the reasons. When I discovered that oh, back in around 2001 or two, um, and I found a, like a, a discussion forum of people mm. that are afraid of, uh, have a phobia of defecating, mm. but yet obviously they put it off for as long as they can with various means of avoidance, but obviously you have to eventually go um, and they're not any better. And that really helped me to uh, have the confidence to say, you know what, you don't need to vomit in order to get over this phobia that that won't even necessarily help Hmm. because look at these other people, you know, they, doesn't help them. Um, 
did you want to say more about no, that, Dr. Beale? We do see some people with emetophobia who have also got a fear of being fetally inconstant as well. And it does have clearly have some overlap in terms of some of the processes, the um, fears of losing control, the fears of not knowing if you're going to be incontinent and uh, various safety seeking and avoidance behaviors and so on, and constantly monitoring. So um, it's just that it's, it's, it struck me that it's not as common as emetophobia. And I just don't know why, <laughs> you know, one end is more common than the other end. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, it may be that, that there is a great deal of shame. Shame. In in my go ahead, Doctor Keys. In my experience with people who fear um, being incontinent, the that can be such a hugely kind of personal experience in terms of what, like a unique experience of what they're actually fearing. You know, with with vomit phobia, there's kind of right. you know various themes within what people are afraid of, but with you know, with incontinence, it can be so many different aspects of it that's actually the driver of, of the anxiety. You know, so so like the the uncertainty, the loss of control. I've um, assessed people who it's more of like a fear of contamination, for example, and fear of being dirty. Yes. Um, and also, there's the whole social element of <laughs> social rejection, um, and 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 that kind of thing. So right. I think it's not kind of a homogenous group of people, I guess, or a homogenous group of fears. It can be very different. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I wonder how many of them are out there. I haven't looked into any research on it, but I think our listeners, um, many of our listeners are going to identify with this. So I'm glad that you raised it. Um, the, how, in, in your book, do you tackle the sex differences? Why? You know, something I'd like to know before I die. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the metrophobia 90 to 95 percent women? I don't know. Isn't anxiety, aren't anxiety disorders in general um, more? Not, not as likely, high as that. Not as, not high, as high, high as that. that. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, we do. I mean, I think, is it uh, Dr. Boshin that did, did a, um, a study? I think I have it here. So anyway, uh, uh, that um, about 6% of women and 1% of men like worldwide are afraid of vomiting, which is not the same as having a phobia, but like 7% of the population is, you know, like 23 million people in the United States. That's, that's a huge amount of people should be able to at least identify uh, being afraid of it. But yeah, but not, not that high. Um, no, I, I, I don't even have a theory. Do you? <laughs> we got a few ideas, haven't we, Ali? But, mm. <laughs> um, I mean, as you say, partly socioculturally, I think, because I think men's attitude to vomiting tends to be, you know, it's all a bit of a joke, better in, better than, better out than in, right. and all this kind of thing. It can be all sort of um, very jokey right. in the pub and so on. But women, it's all about, um, I think, much more serious in terms of preventing of harm and contamination, not being and, and so on. Mm. Not being um, ladylike, not, maybe, you know. Yes. Um, whereas, I, I don't know. There may be some genetic input. Another couple of ideas that I have um, that come to mind is is the the role um, of women is is kind of in terms of childbearing, I guess. Um, you know, morning sickness, having to look after children traditionally and, and coming into contact with with those kinds of scenarios more often. Um, but also it it might be to do with the fact that we just don't really know how many men are affected with it because they just don't really want to come forward. You know, it's it might be that it's a lot more shameful for them to actually admit that they have this issue and, and just seek help for it. And, you know, across many disorders, it, it's more common for men to kind of seek other ways to kind of self-soothe, you know, um, self-medicate for example um rather than seek therapy so so it could also be a, a bit of that going on mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i i do know that when i was working with children for a few years um i saw a lot of little boys a lot you know a lot a lot more boys uh ratio to girls than adults so maybe it's changing i don't know I don't know. I look forward to your research on on that um, for sure. Um, 
a moment ago, we, we, we were just briefly mentioning medication. And I want to thank you. Um, I assume that uh, it, it's, I, want, I just want to say thank you for the chapter on medication, on SSRIs. I think, um, Dr. Veal, with, with you being a psychiatrist, like very few people are able to prescribe these drugs and don't, so therefore don't really know anything about them and their relation to um, emetophobia. I've, I've found that they do help people uh, that I work with who have a lot of sort of anxiety all the time like they're just afraid all the time mm -hmm. and then if they if they start taking an ssri that often goes down far enough that they're able to do the work that we do um would i, I would say any, it may help some at the ocd end of the spectrum it may help as you say take the edge of things but it's never a cure for metaphobia it, it, as I said, it might help take the edge off. And it's right. never quite sure how long, you know, if you perhaps then if you can have good CBT for the emetophobia, then you can come off them. Or it really depends then what it's like afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. It's it's not a miracle cure, you mm. know, and neither is anything else that is out there on the Internet claiming to be such as and you you mentioned this hypnosis and uh, even EMDR. Um, uh, I've had some EMDR personally. I found it fascinating. It was really cool. It helped me with a lot of things. It didn't make a dent in the phobia one bit. Um, mm -hmm. Other than it was helpful to you know sort out maybe where it came from and a few things like that. Um, but that was also a lot of years ago. So perhaps. It, it, it is better now. Um, again, you, you're emphasizing that the uh, CBT is the only evidence-based um, treatment for emetophobia. And um, I wanted to ask about that uh, because a lot of our listeners are therapists. Um, and it, it, Around the research, there has only been one randomized controlled trial so far, and that was with the, the late uh, um, uh, Riddle Walker. I forget her first name already. It's Lori. Or, That's right. Yes. Uh, and yourself, Dr. Veal. Um, yeah. Are there more randomized controlled trials on the horizon? In particular, mm -hmm. what I'm interested in is comparing forms of of treatment for example act act um mm. some people tried uh dbt uh and and um anyway what's on the horizon i guess for, uh, the um, i'm not convinced that it would be necessarily helpful to do that sort of comparison of things like act or in other words, very similar, similar, but overlapping treatments. I think yes. the CE trials that compare, say, a good CBT with um, uh, hypnotherapy. Um, and I think I would like to see more trials that involve um, trying to improve the CBT. So, for example, there's a lot of interest in using virtual reality for Yes, I, that. that's a that's I, one I, of my I, questions. Tell, tell us about that. <laughs> well, we haven't done it, yet, but I'm sure that somebody will. Um, in terms of actually developing programs which you could use your, um, you know, virtual reality goggles on and actually create your watching yourself vomiting in various ways with right. the sound and the smells and everything else. Um, yeah. So, and it would be far better than watching other people vomiting on YouTube or whatever, because most people I find with metaphobia find these things as very unrealistic and um, not that helpful. Right. Yes. Well, they, I, I like to use them because it elicits a fear response. Sure. And, and so, you know, that's kind of, but the, the part of, 
uh, I mean, I use interoceptive um, work with people at the end, um, which they find very difficult, but, you know, and giving up safety behaviors is one of the primary things. You know, mm-hmm. what are you going to give up when? I have a little workbook that has a calendar, three month mm-hmm. calendar in it. Right in here, when, you know, when are you going to get, what's your, what's your end date? When mm-hmm. are you going to stop with the mints and the gum and the ginger and the tea and mm-hmm. asking for reassurance and, you know. Um, but don't you find all, um, the smell of vomit is more powerful and also the sound of vomiting? Is more powerful triggers as opposed and the stimuli yes. and exposure rather than watching other people vomiting. Yes, yeah, yes, definitely the sounds and the smell. Um, you can buy that butyric acid; it's quite mm. a harmless. Uh, you can buy it if in America on Amazon.com. Now I'm in Canada; mm. we can't get it. You probably can't get it in the UK. You were saying, um, but uh, one woman, one woman bought it. And put it into to some vegetable soup or something, and then she texted me, "Now, how do I get the smell out of my house?" Oh no! <laughs> like, she, she got rid of the. She, she, yeah. You've got to keep exactly. it out. It is just awful. Yeah, yeah. So I recommend that now. Do this exercise outside. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a bit like this. I was going to say, as a therapist, you have to be careful about. Um, which foods you choose for your exposure because I've definitely been put off some favorites for a while. (laughs) Is that right? Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, I think it's a very natural thing that if, if you vomited after eating something, you don't want to eat that thing again. Like just regular neurotypical people. They, they're, they're like, um, my husband, I, I often give my husband as a great example of what you emphasize in this book, over and over. Uh, my husband's not afraid of anything uh, that I know of. We've been married 40, 40 years. He did not vomit for 32 years. He didn't do anything to try not to. It's like wash my hands before eating a sandwich. Well, I washed them in the shower this morning. What are you talking about? You know, and, and so um, you, you know, the fact that you have not vomited and you've used all these avoidance and safety behaviors is it's not relevant. I mean, you know, my husband didn't do any of that and he didn't vomit either, um, you know, for years and years. So, but I will say he will not drink sangria ever. He doesn't even want to look at it um, (laughs) because he was quite sick on it one time. So I think that's pretty, pretty common. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the, you know, we talked uh, a bit before about tolerating anxiety versus controlling it or extinguishing. I think extinguishing was a word that we used to use uh, to, about the fear and um, not not looking, you know, kind of, I mean, you don't mention ACT in your book, acceptance and commitment therapy, but you kind of allude to the same, you know, the same sort of principles and um, which are accepting, tolerating, you know, that, that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And also being compassionate with yourself. I found that very fascinating what you were talking about so much so that I ordered the book, (laughs) which came in less than 24 hours, by the way. it, Dr. Keys, can you can you talk a little bit about about that? In terms of act for emetophobia, self compassion, I think. Self compassion, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, and it. Yeah, so um, in our practice, that's um, we draw very heavily on on kind of um, compassionate work um, for people in terms of you know, not only in the therapeutic work we do, but also for people to understand um, you know how their emetophobia develops and to try and work out um or work on a more compassionate kind of understanding of of the development of their difficulties um you know that that you're not to blame it's not your fault um for having this problem and and you can't choose um you know the genes that you're born with the traits that you have the site you know the psychological and personality traits you have and and the 
um, the kind of early experiences you you were given in life, you can't choose those things. Um, and your emetophobia is very much kind of a product of, of a mixture of all those factors. Um, so it's a kind of you're not to blame for having them. But also, I guess we we try to work on um, people, you know, in, in order to soothe their kind of anxiety response or their fear response. We we try and, and help people to develop a more ca- compassionate way of kind of dealing with with their, their fears and, and their triggers um, in order to, to kind of work towards their goals. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in particular, people with emetophobia often um, do have a very strong kind of critical voice or, or um think in, in very kind of critical ways you know that they they need to be perfect or that they shouldn't have these difficulties or that they're just being silly um and can really kind of minimize their own problems in that respect so kind of as a therapist especially helping them to develop a more self-compassionate voice I think is really vital work um and, and we draw a lot on those techniques um that, uh, I think that's fantastic I really look forward to um reading the book which which is actually my computer is sitting on it right now it is called the Compa- compassionate mind workbook um by chris irons and elaine beaumont um and and for those of you listening uh that might be something you might like to read after you read free yourself from emetophobia <laughs> um it, really, well, i'm just so just so excited that this is this is a thing. Um, one of the uh, the last question that I, that I have actually one of the components of CBT is the C part, the cognitive um, part. Behavioral is you know changing how you behave or what your actions are, and we've talked a lot about that. Changing your thoughts. Um, it it seems that in the book you're you're talking more about a mindfulness of approach, like letting your thoughts just be there. Maybe, I think you have this wonderful illustration of imagine you're lying by a stream of water and, and they all these thoughts, just put them on leaves and let them kind of go down the stream. That's quite different from the more traditional CBT approach, which, you know, I learned way back or whatever, which is to challenge your thoughts, uh, to ask, you know, is this true? What is the evidence for it? And um, I find with the metaphobics, you know, they, they have valid thoughts, but they're just not helpful. You know, they're not, it doesn't help you to say, yes, you could vomit today. True. Yes, you could. Mm-hmm. Does that help you? No, no. Um, d- d- would you like to talk a bit more about this sort of different, what I would call a bit of different approach from the classic CBT? Well, it's very difficult to be rational with your uh, it worries about vomiting because they're saying, I think what's more helpful is to focus on the processes. And these processes are things like the worry, ruminating, the way that you might be very self-focused and monitoring, and the way, the, the way that you want certainty and guarantees. Yeah. So these have beliefs in themselves and motivations in terms of what it is, why you're doing these particular things. And these are, might be more helpful to try to uh, understand whether these are actually a, a helpful way of going about things, trying to demand guarantees and, and absolute certainty that you're not going to vomit or that you're trying to uh, the, the process of the worry ruminating and so on. So that those are the things that that's the cognitive aspects, I think, rather than try to question the rationality. What's the evidence that you're going to vomit or whatever it is? I think <laughs> the, other, the other thing to add there is that, for, you know, in my experience, when you're asking people with emetophobia, like what the cognition is or what the thought is, they just... They yeah. just don't know. <laughs> so it's really difficult to yes. challenge or test out something that someone can't put into words. So all they know is that it's just really, really awful and it has to not happen. Like I have to avoid it at all costs. Um, that yes. can be a tricky thing to kind of deal with, with traditional kind of CBT methods. So I guess, or, or you know, like um, thought challenging, I guess. So so it, it does become more about kind of the exposure. And, and as David said, thinking, you know, more about... Um, the processes that stop you from living the life that you want to and, and, and stop you from, from reaching your goals, I guess. Right. Right. Well, is there anything either of you would like to add before we wrap up? 
Um, no, I, I just really want the emetophobia community to come together because, you know, and to raise funds to be able to really highlight this to our politicians and others that this is a serious problem uh, and it, we need a solution because, you know, there isn't easy solutions at the moment. It's bloody difficult. It's bloody tough to to get over yeah. emetophobia. Mm. And, um, yes. you know, we need, it needs a lot of research and work on it. Yes. Th yes. And thank you for that. And uh, and for those therapists who are listening who may want to uh, get into research or, or uh, students listen to the podcast as well. Um, it's a wonderful area for research uh, because it's it's got, you know, I mean, I can print out every article that, on emetophobia and put it in a binder. Imagine, you know. Imagine doing that with OCD or something, you know, there, there'd be thousands, tens of thousands. There's just research is really badly needed. Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Keyes? Um, I guess just um, personally, for me, it was just really, um, I guess, really nice to hear your kind of reaction to the book, because I guess it's just come out and we don't, we've just, just come out into the world. We don't really know like how people are going to receive it. So, and our main aim with it was to, to make the things that we do a lot more accessible so that, you know, people can get the help that they need and the help they deserve. So that for me has just been really nice to, to hear that it has, that it's been received well and it's, it's been helpful. So thank you for that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and it's, it's a beautiful book. I mean, it's a beautiful cover art. Um, it, it just looks lovely. And it's got, you know, for those of you who are thinking of ordering it, uh, it, it is a self help book. It has lots of um, worksheets and, and things like that in it so that you can kind of go through, but it's also a book, I think, that you could, um, give to your therapist and and the two of you work through the book together uh, I think would be be something wonderful especially therapists that aren't that familiar with emetophobia um, it, it it yeah it, it's really great I can't say enough good about it um, and thank you so much again for coming on this podcast um, that's it's really special to have you Thank you so much for inviting us. It was lovely to talk to you. And thank you to all of our listeners and subscribers each week. We've now had over 20,000 downloads to date, which is just wonderful. There are costs associated with producing this podcast. If you find it helpful, uh, you can buy me a coffee. Just go down to the bottom of the notes on the episode and you'll see a link right there. You can click and for a couple of bucks or a couple of pounds, you can buy me a coffee. If you are looking for more information and uh, basically everything that we talked about today, you can go to my website at emetophobiahelp.org. It has a lot of information. We will see you next week or hear from you. Uh, meanwhile, stay safe and get vaccinated if you have not yet.